Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Bitcoin talk where we feature existing and upcoming Bitcoin developers and professionals in the space. Today, we have Anmol Sharma with us. Anmol is a third year Triple IT student at Triple IT Jabalpur. He is an alum of Summer of Bitcoin and he has worked in Bcoin on coin selection algorithms. And he has one of those monumental work from last year from Summer of Bitcoin that caught a lot of noise in the space. And now he is working as a junior backend Bitcoin engineer in Bolt. So thank you Anmol for joining us and welcome. Hi, thanks Raj for that wonderful introduction. Yeah, I'm happy yeah. to be here. Yep. And we are excited to have this conversation with you. We have a lot to learn and we have a lot of questions. So let's drive right into it. Tell us a bit about your background, what I've been studying and how did you find about Bitcoin? I joined college in 2022, like just around the year in which COVID hit. So most of my studies for the first one and a half years were online. I'm pursuing mm -hmm. electronics and communications engineering. I chose electronics and communications engineering just because I also wanted to learn about the hardware aspects of computer science. So mm -hmm. like how actually like transistors work and how chips are manufactured. Interestingly, I'm one of the few people who can write code in assembly language. So that's okay. something very that's cool. That's really cool. That's really cool. Yeah. Uh, so that's one I, of I the wish, first. I wish of... we could get like bar points of like making a brag about it. Like I can write assembly, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, those who can like, that's a superpower. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, that, exactly. So yeah, I've always been interested in like systems engineering and that kind of stuff. So yeah, that, that was my background. I'm pursuing electronics and communication engineering. Last year, I participated in Summer of Bitcoin. So that was my first exposure to actually getting to learn about Bitcoin. There are two kinds of people in the world who know about Bitcoin and have read Bitcoin standard, who know about Bitcoin and haven't read Bitcoin standard. So okay. those are like, so before summer of Bitcoin, I was in type two, but right. <laughs> through summer of Bitcoin, I actually got to know about what Bitcoin is really and how it changes everything. Right. So, and so yeah, what was I, your first encounter of the word Bitcoin? Like even before summer of Bitcoin, when was the first time you heard about it and how? I think it was like through my friends in school, I was in ninth standard and there was a lot of news around a guy who in in Bihar, I think, who actually had 50 Bitcoins and sold them to get his daughter married. There was there's a there was a news article about it. So that was that's when I first actually heard about cryptocurrencies in general. Okay. So, and that was around say long time ago, 2012, yeah. 13. Yeah, I think like 2015, if I'm not wrong. As usual, it didn't click or it didn't stick and you never you didn't pay attention. So then what yeah. happened? Oh, how did you find Summer of Bitcoin and how did you decide like that's something you want to do? So uh, there was a lot of noise around these cryptocurrencies and shit coins in 2022 and 2021 right. during the COVID period. So that's when I like uh, decided that I want to learn more because like college is a place to like explore different stuff. So I was also like exploring and suddenly I heard about this amazing opportunity called Summer of Bitcoin. And then I took a shot and finally got selected and did some amazing work there. Right, right. So you did made some amazing work over there. We'll be talking about it shortly. So how was the overall experience of Summer of Bitcoin? How did you find it? And um, how did you compare with, with other kind of like... Um, uh, programs or like uh, internships or like uh, things that you see in general technical studies? Yeah, so I found the, my first encounter of Summer of Bitcoin was on LinkedIn, but I didn't pay much attention to it at that time. But then one of my seniors shared the link to the official website in our WhatsApp group. And then was when I finally checked it out and went through the website and about the projects then I like finally decided to apply at first. So the, in talking about Bitcoin space in general, and especially the technical part it, for a new developer who is not experienced and is yet in college, it's very overwhelming to grasp all the technical aspects and like it gets scary sometimes mm -hmm. that why am I even doing this? You start to right. question yourselves a lot. So uh, that was 
that's the stage i think every developer will face when he is trying to get into the bitcoin space and that's the most important thing which you need to overcome thankfully like i had a great mentor who was with me from the start so i was mentored by matthew zepkin and mm-hmm. whenever like i had a doubt about like basically anything he was like open for it it doesn't have to be related to the project which i was like trying to uh, work on like mm-hmm. anything based about bitcoin he like helped me go, go through that phase and he is always right. like very motivating so right. that was like one of the best things about summer of bitcoin because you have so many like awesome people around you who will be th- so if you this is the thing which i love about bitcoin community is that if you ask for help there will be like hundreds of people who who would want to help you yeah so yeah. The, the the community is so welcoming to especially to new developers because we are yes. all very excited to yeah. orange field people yeah, yeah. So and and that has been like my personal experience also been uh, going through the bitcoin development communities like it, you you feel it like how much people are willing to like put in the extra step so that you can get the stuff right and that's an humbling experience on its own and uh, so this leads us to the point of like so what you worked on some of bitcoin was mostly around the algorithm called coin selection and uh, coin selection is a kind of algorithm that basically probably only exist in the context of bitcoin because in nowhere else you have to uh, make this kind of like um, uh subset some kind of problem solutions uh not in many general applications so what caught your eyes on coin selection and w- why you got interested into it in general so like algorithms i've always been like fascinated w- about algorithms so i like to like play around they are like puzzles which i like to solve so mm-hmm. yeah i've also done a lot of competitive programming uh, during mm-hmm. my college years so when i learned about this project and how it so uh competitive programming is like a kind of sport where you where there are questions and you try to solve uh these questions through by using algorithms data structures etc so mm-hmm. i felt that coin selection is a lot like that and you don't see a lot of competitive programming use cases in real life it's good mm-hmm. for like building your mental ability and Uh, improving your critical thinking but mm-hmm. like this was something where i can actually put use my knowledge which i gained by competitive programming so that's mm-hmm. what caught my attention when learning about this project and uh, when i was talking to matthew about the project he told me like how the uh, coin selection algorithm in bitcoin is pretty shit and mm-hmm. it just keeps uh, consolidating the utxos until there mm-hmm. are like thousands and thousands and it doesn't optimize for fee so right. i had a chance to make a real impact to users who use bitcoin as their wallet and yeah so that that's uh, one of the few uh, reasons i chose coin selection nice. really interesting and uh, yeah it kind of makes sense for you to caught eye on this because at the same time coin selection is kind of like a um the advanced part of like bitcoin engineering uh, there are not many people out there in the world who are experts on this part of the domain and coin selection wasn't even a, a major part of like bitcoin development conversations in the early days it it later became dominant when lots of wallet came into pack picture lots of uh, different kinds of usage pattern starts to emerge and then people realize like oh like we need to think about this part of the puzzle also and make that thing efficient so it's very interesting to see a student getting into a part like coin selection and having meaningful contributions over there so let's jump right into it and uh, let's let's do get the deep dive of your work and let's talk about coin selection now yeah of course so yep and we have the screen up and uh, yep the stage is yours okay so like uh, coin selection talking about in general is the process how you select coins from a wallet and optimize for fees and transaction time so first of all uh, we'll talk about what is a utxo a utxo is like a uh, bank note which you have in your like physical wallet so bitcoin was uh, made to resemble cash so most of the concepts and like 
terms are uh, used in from like day to day world so uh, you you can think of a utxo like a coin which is which you use in daily life so let's assume you are using bitcoin and you want to buy milk so you go to the milk store and buy milk from that well let's assume you have a 100 rupee note and the milk 100 rupee note a 50 rupee note and 20 rupee note and a 10 rupee note so the milk costs uh, let's say 20 rupees so there are many ways in which you can pay for the milk you can just pay directly using a 20 rupee note because that's the exact amount you need you can pay a 50 rupee note and receive 30 rupees back as, as a change or you can cash in your 100 rupee note and get 70 rupees back as a change so mm -hmm. similarly if you if you want to pay using bitcoin there are concept there's a concept called change so just like how you spend a cash note as full so you can't uh tear up a 100 rupee note and use it as a 50 rupee note you either spend complete 100 rupees or you don't spend it at all so utxos are just like that you either spend one complete bitcoin or you don't spend like you can't just do uh cut the bitcoin in half and spend right. 50 bit, uh, yeah. 0.5 bitcoin somewhere else and 0.5 bitcoin somewhere else so let's assume you the coffee costs 0. Uh, 0.2 Bitcoin, which is like way high for a, just a cup of coffee. Yeah. But let's assume. <laughs> let's so assume we have... are in 2011. Yeah, <laughs> let's assume we are in 2011. And so at that time, let's assume that one cup of coffee costs, costs 0.2 Bitcoin. And you have one Bitcoin in your wallet. So what you'll do is you will create a transaction which consumes this one Bitcoin gives 0 0.2 bitcoin to the coffee shop and then the rest of 0 0.8 bitcoin goes back to you in your change address so that's how you get your money back in right. physical world the shopkeeper will give you the change amount but right. there's no uh no shopkeeper no middleman in uh in bitcoin so you yourself you pay yourself the change amount in, in this transaction, so this transaction will basically contain one input and two outputs. So what UTXO kind of stands for is like this individual, indivisible chunk of Bitcoin that cannot be broken into. You have to consume the whole chunk and create two different chunk, one for the shopkeeper and one back for you. And that's what a Bitcoin transaction does. So just wanted to add that point on top of this. Yeah, yeah, of course. Thanks for that, Raj. Now in Bitcoin, we there are no zero fee transactions, so you have to pay a small amount of fee to the miner uh, to incentivize him to include your transaction in the block. So right. the change output which you receive is not exactly the change amount; it's slightly less. So here you you can see that you'll receive about zero point seven nine 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 something, right. and the rest and that is the fee of the transaction and yeah, so this fee is basically implicit and uh, the miner can add this amount in their coinbase transaction and take that amount as the fee so the difference between the sum of the input and the sum of the output is the implicit fee of a transaction yeah so you don't create like a separate output for the fee it's implicit right yeah okay M moving on there's this important question that why do we need to pay fee if there's a mining reward associated with each block so mm -hmm. the first answer is that we'll eventually run out of uh mining reward because every four years the mining reward gets half so eventually it will get to zero so then there will be like open fee market in which your transaction will only get confirmed if you pay a fee to the miner because he's doing right. some work so he needs to right. get rewarded. So we need to pay fee right now because let's assume that there, there is a scenario in which there are 3000 transactions in the mempool and a block can, let's say, assume contain only 500 transactions. Yeah. So in that case, the miner will pick the transactions which pay the highest fee because he wants to earn as much reward as possible for the work he's doing. So. Mm -hmm. 
in that case he'll select the transactions which are which pay the highest fee so he'll sort all the transactions and pick the ones and include them in the block mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. we pay fee right now to incentivize miner to first mine our transactions over other transactions so if you want your transaction to just get included in the next block pay a high fee and it like most okay. definitely will get included in the next block so yeah and that's yeah. like uh, creates the bitcoin fee market basically and uh, yeah. you need this fee market because block space is scarce and everybody want to get into the block space but there's not much room so you have to prioritize transactions in some way so fees are the way we do that yep yep okay moving on let so let's talk about the goals of coin selection so it's very important to know these first one is to minimize the confirmation time we all want our transactions to get confirmed as fast as possible mm-hmm. and the next goal is to minimize the transaction fee but if you notice these two are like contrasting goals you need to pay high fee in order to get your transaction confirmed faster so right. these are these are one of the like challenges of the coin selection to find the right balance between these contrasting goals mm-hmm. so that that's Uh, one of the hard parts of developing coin selection algorithms and the reason why there are so few algorithms right right and also like a certain kind of like balances are only suitable for certain kind of situations depending upon your situation your balance point might shift along yeah exactly so exchanges might want to use a different coin selection algorithm than what mm. normal users do yeah Right. So there's a lot of like ongoing research and development going in this area uh, in this area right now. Mm-hmm. So yeah, another goal of using coin selection is to improve privacy. So there are a lot of chain analysis and data miners. So Bitcoin is a public blockchain, so everything is all the transactions that have ever happened are all publicly available. So chain analysis analysts and data miners can use that and associated with your identity so mm-hmm. in order to improve that uh, the coin selection algorithms we use should be pseudo random so there should be no clear association between the utxos that you are using in the uh, which are being used to build the transaction mm-hmm. so and that, and uh, like uh, you can also like have this kind of situations where a certain wallet is Uh, creating a uh, using a certain kind of coin selection and that is creating a certain kind of footprint in the bitcoin transaction graph yeah. and somebody from external can like lo- analyze those footprints and say like these are the wallet activities that is happening from this wallet so that's also like where uh, carefully selecting and tuning your coin selection comes into play yeah also like one of the good practices of improving privacy is to never use around amounts and payments so if you want to pay 0.5 bitcoin to someone like it's better if you pay 0.492315 because that uh, that way if you pay let's say you have 1.23 bitcoin and you pay someone 0.5 bitcoin the change amount becomes obvious so which of the two outputs are changed it becomes obvious because the round payment will most likely be the mm-hmm. payment which you are trying to spend and the other one will be the change address so these right. are like few uh, practices which are used in coin selection right right makes sense in order to hide the change from the transaction okay another uh, a goal for coin selection is to so that uh, is that it shouldn't create small change output so the reason for doing that is because for every thing which you include in the in the transaction you pay a fee so let's assume you have a lot of small outputs which you want to spend and there's one big output so if you consolidate all those small outputs in a transaction the transaction size will increase and you will have to pay a large fee for that Yeah. for spending those small change outputs yeah. 
So, so this is one of the like uh, confusion people have is like uh, whether the fee is dependent on the amount that you are trying to send. It's actually not. It's dependent on the size of the transaction that you will end up creating. And the size of the transaction is heavily determined on how you are so selecting your input UTXOs. If you have a 10 you, uh, Bitcoin you chunk of UTXO and you have 10 one Bitcoin chunk of UTXO, it's much cheaper to spend the 10 BTC chunk than to spend 10 one BTC chunks. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, so also the, so there's one thing which we like, we always talk about in coin selection is that the fee for spending those one output should be, should not be more than 1% of the actual value which you are trying to spend. So let's say you have 100 sats so the fee which you want to pay for spending those 100 sats should not be more than one uh, one sat for mm -hmm. that particular input. So using this calculation, so the ideally the change amount for the fee should be more than uh, 100k sats. Right. And also you want to like reduce change amount, like very small change amount because it also takes fees in order to use the change amount in later part. Yeah, exactly. Because change amount will eventually become input in some other transaction, which you will make in future. Yes. So we right. want to reduce that. And like inputs are the major chunk of the transaction. They are like approximately 65% part of the transaction uh, size is consumed by the inputs because it contains the signature, the locking script, the redeem script, mm -hmm. like everything is there. Okay. okay. So yeah, that, that was another goal of coin selection to go, uh, it shouldn't create small change amount also uh yeah one of the community goals of coin selection is to reduce the overall utxo pool size so as the adoption increases the utxo pool size has been continuously growing and mm -hmm. because of use of uh old coin selection algorithms that are not really yeah. good so so let's assume you are making a transaction and it has uh, it has one input and one output so in this in this case it won't affect the utxo pool at all because you're subtracting one input from the utxo pool and adding one output so the net uh, change in the utxo pool would be zero so ideally we try to consume more inputs in the in a transaction and produce less outputs than the inputs which you're using in order to reduce the overall utxo size utxo mm -hmm. pool size Right, so and this relates the to goals. the decentralization and the scalability of the Bitcoin network because UTXO pool is something that every nodes also need to maintain along with um, along with the blockchain data, and and some part of the UTXO pool is actually residing on the memory of the node. So yeah. getting the UTXO pool shorter will actually enhance performance at the same time, um, same time like increase the scalability and uh, not blow up the database of the node runner so that's why it's an important goal also yeah exactly so like if you run a node in spv board or like even if you use a uh, try to run a node on a mobile you don't have as much disk space and memory on your on a small device so yeah it's good to have a small utxo pool overall yeah next we'll talk about why coin selection is very difficult so there's a class of a computer science problems called NP hard. So coin selection is a NP hard problem, a problem and NP hard problems are like very difficult to solve. They are, they are solvable, but the time it takes to solve them grows exponentially with the number of uh, UTXOs you have basically in talking about in terms of coin selection. So it's literally an NP hard problem. And another uh, thing which makes coin selection very difficult is that there are contrasting goals. So we talked about how we want to minimize fee, but we want to increase the, like we want to, we want to minimize fee and we, yeah, we want to minimize fee and we also want to minimize the confirmation time. Right. So uh, finding the right balance is also very difficult. And like, there are many use cases which are very different from each other. So exchanges might want to pay a high fee just to get their transaction included in the latest block. Whereas like normal users would want to like pay less fee as compared mm -hmm. to those exchanges. So finding the right balance and the use case for that uh, particular algorithm is like, very difficult. And 
there's no i would say there's no perfect quant selection algorithm every like algorithm has its trade offs the next reason why it's very hard to solve quant selection problem is because as the number of utxo increases the time complexity which is used to solve uh, the uh, select uh, the inputs grows exponentially so let's assume you have 10 trans, uh, 10 utxos in your wallet so in that case the time complexity will be bigo of 2 to the power 10 because there this is the number of combinations from which you can select but mm-hmm. as uh, the number of uh, utxo will increase the time complexity will go from like if let's say if you have 1000 transactions it will be like 2 to the power uh, 1000 which is like very big number mm-hmm. so yep. so it will take more time to solve that so that's another reason why we don't want to fill our wallet with a lot of utxos because it right. takes time to build a transaction makes sense okay cool so yeah now let's talk a bit about the algorithms which are used in coin selection so branch and bound coin selection algorithms was written by merch and basically merch is the person who did all the research for this coin selection and he also wrote a very nice paper on different coin selection algorithms and yep. he is the one who wrote the pr for coin selection in uh, bitcoin core so branch and bound coin selection yeah so uh, this is like one of the best coin selection algorithms i would say so far mm-hmm. but there are trade offs to branch and bound too as i said like no coin selection is perfect yeah so let's talk a bit about how, what are the pros and cons in the uh, in this branch and bound so first of all the biggest pro in coin uh, in branch and bound is that there is no change output so if there is no change output it solves two problems that it re- reduces the overall utx pool size Mm-hmm. and we don't have to spend the change output in future so we right. also save fees in future that's mm-hmm. one of the big plus of branch and mm-hmm. bound another thing is that there is no will you always have like no change situations what if like i have like that situation of i have a 10 btc and then i have to spend 5 uh, there is like no way i will like there is no way it can create Uh, a non-change transaction without burning the rest of it to the miner. Yeah, so that that's one of the big cons of branch and bound is that it doesn't always provide a solution. Mm-hmm. So okay. in that case, it won't return a solution. Okay. Okay. It will Makes say sense. that it, I it will only find changeless solutions, or it will say that I can't find a solution. Okay. Okay. So it will either say like I know a changeless solution, or say like okay, there is no solution that is changeless, so I am not go for, good for the job. Go use some other ways of like selecting yeah. your coin, or create a change. Yeah, yeah. That so yeah. That that's why we use uh, multiple algorithms when we are trying to build a transaction. So Bitcoin Core uses three algorithms. So first, right. it tries to run branch and bound, and if branch and bound fails, then it, there are two other algorithms. Right. Okay. Okay. another reason is that it improves privacy because there's no clear association between the utxos so it it selects utxos pseudo randomly basically it constructs a dfs tree and tries to select and unselect different utxos but let's not get into the technicals it's good for okay. privacy right okay another uh, yeah it reduces the overall utxo pool size so either it will remain same because it will have one input and one output or there will be multiple inputs and just one output which will reduce the overall utxo pool size okay also it selects inputs based on fee rate so there's a concept called effective value in which we pre calculate the fee we like there's a hacky way to do it we pre calculate the fee for for all the outputs that will be included in our in the transaction and the fee for the input is accounted by the input itself so for example mm-hmm. let's say if if we are trying to spend uh the 10000 sats and the fee for spending 10000 sats is uh say 50 sats so the inter- the effective value of this input will be 9 9 uh 99950 okay so we'll consider this when we are taking the value for the uh, for coin selection we won't consider this utxo as 100000 we'll consider it as this okay 
so yeah it's a, so that's why uh, it's one of the good uh, algorithms because before select before even selecting the coins we can pre calculate the fee for each utxo and select right. the current fee rate right and and uh, there has to be a like uh, as you mentioned like just now is like there has to be a notion of the fee rate of how the effective values are calculated right and probably bitcoin core uses a default long term fee rate set around say 10 sats per v byte or something like that and yeah. using that it calculates like so effective fee rate is in a way Or, or effective value is in a way discounting the value of the UTXO by the cost of spending that UTXO. So yeah, but it doesn't use the long term fee rate. That's for like some other purpose, which I'll talk about okay. later in the presentation. But okay. it uses the current fee rate, so it can it has a fee estimator which is uses okay. to predict the current fee rate, and okay. it uses that to calculate the effective value. yeah so okay. basically what you said mentioned about effective value is exactly correct that's discounting the value of uh, the utxo by the amount of fee which you will have to pay to spend that utxo right right so in a sense like some utxos could even have negative effective values and that will basically say they are uneconomical utxos you got to you yeah. got to spend more than to extract the value of that utxo exactly so they'll just remain in the in the wallet that's why we don't want to create small change out rooms right makes sense okay so yeah let's talk about the cons so it it doesn't always provide a solution that's one of the cons because it only it can only find changeless solutions mm -hmm. another thing is that we can't uh, we can't cpf pay for transaction is tough so child pays for parent is a way in which if a uh, if we pay a very low fee for a transaction and it gets stuck in the mempool we can do cpfp and in pump up the fee rate but since right. there's no change out no change out put you can't do that yeah yeah makes sense mm. another reason is that it's very computationally expensive so it although it finds a changeless solution if we have a lot of like utxo let's say Ten thousand or maybe hundred thousand UTXOs in the in the wallet. It it's possible that there is a changeless solution, and we don't But find it. But it could take a lot it. of time to find it, and uh, yeah, a it lot could. of iterate tries to find it. Yeah. So there are uh, there is a limit on the number of iterations or the number of uh, tries it will make to find a solution because mm -hmm. it it can run infinite almost infinitely or take a very long time if there is a there are a lot of utxo so we need to hard, have a hard coded limit so right. the, it's and what's there. the current uh, limit looks like uh, how many iterations in general it will try I, to perform i think it's 1 million it's oh. either 1 million or 100k okay okay yeah so it will make those tries and if it doesn't find a solution it will say that there is no solution but like uh, usually it, it it finds a solution if there is one okay but there, if you talk about the extreme cases then it probably won't mm -hmm. yeah so it's very computationally expensive that's one of the cons now let's talk about a new coin selection algorithm which i uh, wrote for bcoin so this is not there in bitcoin core yet because they use knapsack solver which is mm -hmm. which is also by the way very computationally expensive but we didn't want to use that in bcoin because javascript is already like a slow language as compared to c++ and mm -hmm. we want to build transactions as fast as possible so lowest larger uh, is like i could say one of the fastest algorithms mm -hmm. uh, which which can be used for coin selection because in bcoin it can work in log of n time and log of n okay. time is very fast okay that's interesting like we had like a log of 2 to the power n um, over order of 2 to the power n to got into log of n so that's that's a lot of improvement over there yeah exactly so it uses binary search under the hood to optimize the search for selecting the right coin that's the reason why it's so fast let's uh, talk about the pros and cons of uh, lowest ledger by the way this name was given by merch okay i'm very bad at 
naming <laughs> thing so we also <laughs> we also uh, talked to merch and i presented this algorithm to him just to like get his views and he also reviewed my pull request to be quite nice. on that okay yeah any any chance so, of like we are getting this into core anytime soon yeah uh, when we remove knapsack solver we can get it into core oh okay so there is a conflict Because, with knapsack solver and this one no we can get uh, we can also add this in core but they won't be like very good use because they both do the same thing is that uh, they find a change solution but uh, okay. this does it faster this does it faster than the knapsack solver so that sounds to yeah. me like a good argument for this to replace knapsack solver correct me if i'm wrong knapsack solver is the next fallback that core does after it doesn't found a solution in bnb yeah uh, knapsack solver and there's also an algorithm called single random draw so these are right. the two fallbacks yeah so uh, so in uh, this uh, single random draw is kind of like the dumb version of it it's like what you do when you randomly don't have any selected. other better things to do so randomly yeah. selecting the coin until you fit, hit the target and so knapsack solver is like a better like a more intelligent way of like solving the subset sum problem and uh, you know in a way like this is kind of like competing with knapsack solver in that way and uh, like it's a better replacement for knapsack solver like can that be said um i'm not sure if that like it would be an improvement because this also has its pros and cons but okay. yeah we can get a workable version that can compete with knapsack solver and be much faster than it okay and now this is already implemented in bcoin yeah this is already there in bcoin Okay, cool. One of the biggest cons is why I don't want it to get into core is that sometimes it will produce a small change output, and this is like very okay. bad. Mm-hmm. So small for, means there like are very like dusty kind of outputs. Not dusty because we have limit. So there is something called uh, min change amount, which is set to hundred k in Bitcoin Core. So mm-hmm. we can use that and produce a better change. Uh, better we can improve this. Uh, algorithm but right now i don't think it's fit to get into core there like there has to be for more work put into this right makes sense but knapsack solver is not very good either because it just okay. like optimizes for fee and keeps grinding down the utx so it basically does the same thing mm-hmm. okay fair enough yeah so when it becomes when this algorithm becomes better than knapsack solver maybe we can include it in core fair enough okay so yeah so one of the biggest pros is that uh, it's very fast in finding a solution so it will al- always uh, find a solution if there is a so- if a solution exists so unless your wallet balance is less than the target you are trying to spend it will always find a solution and it will do it like mm-hmm. very fast mm-hmm. okay and uh, another reason for using low slats is that it improves privacy there's no like clear association between uh, utxos which is like a big plus mm-hmm. and it it does uh, this kind of like randomness in the amount automatically or yeah yeah it does okay and it also reduces the utxo pool size cool because cool. it tries to spend more in more inputs than the outputs Okay, so it will always try to keep reducing its UTXO numbers, and yeah, uh, yep. not But, not always like in general. In general, because yeah. okay, it also optimizes tries to optimizes for fee. So if the fee rate is very high, it won't like spend uh, a lot a lot of UTXOs. It will just spend one big UTXO instead mm-hmm. of ten small UTXOs. Mm-hmm. But if the fee okay. is low, then it will try to uh, spend ten UTXOs over that one. Uh, big utx makes sense okay cons is like it will sometimes yeah, like, produce small changes yeah like every like algorithm uh, it has its cons so it will sometimes produce a small change output which is not good and mm-hmm. it another thing is that it almost always produces a change output which i don't think it can be considered a con because having a change output sometimes is good good so let's talk about one interesting thing is that where we when lowest larger or knapsack solver will perform better than branch and bound let's talk about that case so let's assume we have uh 
Okay, this is an empty slide which you can use. So let's assume we have 10 coins of 0.1 BTC and one coin of 1 BTC. And let's say, not 1 BTC, let's say we have one coin of 2 BTC and our spending target is one Bitcoin. So let's say Raj is transferring Anmol one Bitcoin. <laughs> How amazing well, would that be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. So in in so if we if branch and bound tries to find a solution, so branch and bound will find one solution which spends ten inputs of zero point one value. Okay. And lowest larger or knapsack solver will find one uh, will select one input that is of two BTC and create a change output of one one. Right. So it, if uh, in case of in a high fee rate environment, spending using branch and bound solution is not good because we'll be paying a high fee for that. Mm -hmm. So in, in in high fee rate environments, we want to you produce a change output and uh, optimize on fees. So here's where, when a brilliant solution by merge comes in. It's called waste metric and it's used to compare different algorithms in mm -hmm. uh, in core and now in Bitcoin. So right. we calculate waste for algorithm considering these three factors. First is the cost of the cost of change. So cost of change is the amount which you'll have to pay to spend that uh, change output in future. And this is where the long term period comes in, which is hard coded mm -hmm. into code as 10 right. sats per V byte. So, so here we are basically like uh, trying to calculate a waste of a selection result. By the way, like thanks to March and all the people who did the research. Here what we are trying to do with West metric is basically like trying to create a, a kind of like cost or a waste that is the characteristics of a certain kind of selection. And we want to categorize different selections and try to have a intelligent judgment about which selection is good and which selection is bad. And we try to use that, do that with West metric. And thanks to March and many people like this is now used in BDK also. We also have an implementation of West metric to basically do this thing, comparison of like different coin selection algorithm. Because sometimes we found it like the user will also not know what is the best coin selection to choose from, even if they are given the option. So either we can go for the cores way, like try one of them and then fall back until you find a solution or present different solution to user and the user can choose the least waste one. Yeah, in Bcoin, we don't present the user. It's like all behind the scenes, it does it right. automatically. Right. Right. But, but it also yeah. gives the programmer an ability to like uh, filter transactions yeah. or like uh, list out the results and uh, select the right one, select the low waste one. It's hard coded to you, uh, prefer use the low waste one, but uh, we can always give the user the choice. Like right. if he wants right. to, so there's one recommended way and there are other ways. Right. Right. Giving user the choice is like if you want to do in the application layer, but giving developers the choice is like the thing that is needed. The developers need yeah. to figure out some ways of like selecting between different coin selection results. And that's where waste metrics comes in. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So waste metric is used to compare different algorithms. So the three factors which are considered is the cost of change. So the cost of change will be zero in branch inbound because there's mm -hmm. no change output. In branch inbound, we'll have the excess selection amount. So this basically, there's a certain uh, balance between how much excess you can throw away into fees. If this excess amount is greater than the cost of change, then we would prefer creating a change output. But if this excess selection amount is less than cost of change, then we'll uh, right. prefer the changeless solution. We'll put the change excess in the fees. And just to remind the user, the fees is the excess between the input and the output. So when we don't have a change amount, so whatever is the difference is entirely in the excess and the miner will be able to claim that in their transaction, in their, in their coin-based transaction. So if our creation of change, like the cost of change is lower 
than the value of the change, then it doesn't make economical sense for us to create the change. So in that case, we will we will pref we'll, we'll, we are better off throwing that fees to the miner and increasing the probability of our confirmation time. Yeah, exactly. Uh, also, uh, one of the best things about coin selection uh, about this waste metric is that it compares the cost of spending inputs now versus in future. So we talked about an example earlier where we were comparing branch and bound with other coin selection algorithms. So branch and bound was producing no change and other algorithm was uh, producing a change output. So in this case, we would in high fee rate environments, we would prefer using lowest larger uh, and produce a change than trying to spend uh, mm -hmm. branch and bound. But in low fee rates environment, we would want to reduce the probability of spending these small UTXOs in future. So we will right. spend them right now in the low uh, in the low fee rate environment. And this is done with the help of uh, wage metric by comparing the cost of spending input now versus the cost of spending in future. Input and in the future. This is an, yeah, this is another like, uh, so the long-term fee rate, which is 10 sats per VY comes, in, comes to play here also because mm -hmm. it's used to calculate the cost of spending inputs in future. Right. Makes sense. And uh, yep, so all, all of these kind of concepts comes together, gives us a better direction of like trying to figure out our coin selection algorithms. Yeah, exactly. And like all these factors comes into play and ultimately affects the user who is actually trying to make a transaction. So right. he can make an intelligent choice and save on right. fees as much as possible, etc. Makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So we have, we have reached the end of the presentation. Okay. Nice. Thank you. That, that was an interesting conversation on coin selection and, uh, yep. I think the viewer will find this very valuable and insightful. Eventually we will also do a proper deeper dive on the algorithms and their mechanisms and how they work under the hood. So thank you for giving us this presentation and thank you for joining us with us. So before we like end this show, we want to talk about few general stuffs around Bitcoin, around what you observed in the community and what you think should be uh, certain right ways of uh, going ahead. So you are already working as a junior backend developer in uh, existing project and you are not even out of your college and you already got there. So some people might look at you and say like, how did you do it? How, how did you make it? We always heard like getting into Bitcoin development is hard. There are not enough jobs. There are not enough opportunities. So what is the path should look like if somebody sitting in their computer watching our video and say like that coin selection is cool. I want to do that too. How they should go about it. So first thing is that find yourself a mentor or a person who can guide you and help you with your problem. And uh, that's where Summer of Bitcoin comes in because uh, they provide you with, I would say, the best mentor, mentors who are out there. And Raj, talking about yourself, you were a mentor in Summer of Bitcoin. So you know how welcoming like uh, the mentors are. So, so if you are still in college, I would say Summer of Bitcoin is the best place to get started into Bitcoin development. If you are out of college and doing a job and want to switch careers and move into the Bitcoin space, I would say that Bitcoin space is so welcoming that you can just post your queries anywhere. Bitcoin Stack Exchange is the We are not just place. only toxic maxis. We are, we are also <laughs> like nice people who want to code and solve problems. Yeah, exactly. We are nice. <laughs> As I said, like this is Bitcoin uh, community is the most welcoming dev community which I've ever seen. Truly. So, Truly. and uh, yeah, and uh, that that's a good suggestion. And uh, uh, what are your recommended like study materials when somebody is going through the courses or like uh, clearing the basic groundwork for Bitcoin? What kind of studies does it look, take, and what kind of things that you can recommend to our viewers? So. I find I personally read Mastering Bitcoin a lot whenever I have a query. So Mastering Bitcoin is one of the best technical books to re read about Bitcoin. Also, there's a book called Programming Bitcoin, which is also very nice. And 
if you want to get into lightning development there's also mastering the lightning network so that's also one of the cool books right. which uh, you should read there are like a ton of blogs explaining like different concepts there are also some blogs on the summer of bitcoin website there are blogs from prominent developers who are, who have been in the space and as i mentioned earlier bitcoin stack exchange right and and most of the bitcoin knowledge is just open out there and basically dispersed into lot of different repositories website github repos blog posts and tutorials yeah. and docs so uh, you just have to like do some scouring and uh, the basic things is like mastering bitcoin programming bitcoin uh, learning bitcoin from command line and yeah. and if you have any recommendation for the cryptography part of it cryptography basics 101 did you followed anything for uh, cryptography i just watched normal like cs lectures on youtubes they are also mm-hmm. like pretty nice okay uh, for okay. a cryptographic part i don't think like it's required very much for a beginner to get into mm-hmm. yeah. you just need to know the concepts like asymmetric encryption etc to get into bitcoin unless you want to actually work in that space you don't need to know learn about how the cryptography yeah, actually how works. the hashing algorithm works you just need to know yeah, exactly. what the hashing algorithm does and uh, yeah. so yeah but it's still good to have a basic intro course there are like lot of free materials out there in youtube in udemy it just doesn't take much yeah. like uh, one month of like going through the course will get you all the basic things that you need to familiarize yourself with the bitcoin concepts um so with that uh, let's move ahead to like um, what does your own bitcoin work look like uh, nowadays what kind of things you were working on and uh, what kind of things you were interested to work on in bitcoin space in general so after finishing my coin selection project in bitcoin uh, i got offered an intern position and pulled where and now i moved into a more permanent role as a junior bitcoin developer so my work at bold mostly revolves around wallet stuff like building the custody etc and for future i think i would love to work on the lightning network but i don't think i can work right now because there's a lot of research and development going on and yeah. you need to be uh, on the research part of things if you right. want to jump into if you go if want to get into core lightning development or if you want to just use a lightning node and build applications on stuff there are a lot of amazing projects like webelin etc get right. alvi is also one of them so right. yeah so uh, i would like to work on the lightning network if i get a chance right but now but now it is even mostly focused on like the layer 1 and uh, building yeah. out the base layer infrastructures for certain kind of project that's that's definitely the best place to start uh, getting into the grooves of bitcoin lightning does take a lot of like contextual understanding if you are going into the protocol side of lightning but if you yeah. are an app developer and a ui ux dev you might actually find a lot of interesting project happening that are easier to get into without understanding a lot of details about bitcoin or lightning and uh, just to just to create something fun and something quick we have, the ecosystem is already developed and uh, we are at the verge where this kind of like burst of lightning application is actually possible so after going through some of bitcoin after doing some work with the community and in the industry now we you were properly in the the zone of bitcoin developer and you are one of the few prominent people in india in the working in the bitcoin development space so how do you see this community emerging it kind of like from an outside perspective how i saw this community coming up it kind of came up with all you people starting graduating from summer of bitcoin since 2020s and then we kind of like started gathering together in a discord group we ended up creating the technical conference where we had a lot of conversations for the first time so how did you find this community that kind of like spontaneously emerged and you were one of the you guys were one of the first mover of that community and where do you see this community going so uh, i think i found this community through summer of bitcoin and i met most of the people there including you raj like you were a mentor in btk 
So well, I let me say, like the... this community existed because of Summer of Bitcoin. Before Summer of Bitcoin, it wasn't there, and uh, yeah. and and it started with you guys, with all the alumni and people who started working on Bitcoin and started and and stuck around. So yeah, yeah. I think like staying uh, staying with Bitcoin is one of the uh, things that only a few of the Summer of Bitcoin alums do. Like there are a lot of people. Who join summer of Bitcoin and just like spend the summer with us and then move on in life. And right. I don't say I hate them, but it would be uh, good to have uh, a more developers joining us right. and improving the Bitcoin ecosystem because there is a lot of uh, requirements here. Like we need good developers who can write good code and build solutions if we like want to fulfill our goal and achieve the Bitcoin standard. And especially okay. in India, like there are a lot of uh, developers who are graduating and there's a especially young developers they are like super talented and if they get into this space i think like we can do wonders and india can be one of the like leading uh, communities in the bitcoin space right but I, I i would also like hint on that part of the topic where you touch is like lot of uh, most of the people from summer of bitcoin doesn't actually stay and that has been the case not only for summer of bitcoin but in general bitcoin in general since the very beginning and since it's still going on there is something different about bitcoin that is not there in big tech or like things that a technical aspirant or a student of computer science look forward to as their success in life they want to get into the google they want to get into the amazon and getting into bitcoin feels weirdly different than that and uh, i'm probably sure you might have also had that conversation with your parents where they're not exactly sure <laughs> whether you are doing the right thing or whether you are just riding a hype and where all these things are going and all these things but if the point is like not everybody will probably um want to get into bitcoin not everybody will probably want to take part into this work, even if they are talented. And my personal read is like the more talented they are in the IITs and the better the, at the rank they are, the lower they will actually want to stick to Bitcoin because they have like other things in life to do. They have other fun uh, stuffs to do. And uh, so, so how do you have perceived this like do you see the kind of difference between you and your peer groups who are not actually even if you try to explain them they don't seem to be too keen and too interested on bitcoin and how do you square this up yeah so uh i try to like ask my friends to get into bitcoin all the time like almost all the time and only two of my friends are actually interested and who are trying to participate in summer of Bitcoin this year. So uh, that's true that there are a lot of talented people who don't want to get into Bitcoin. And I think there are two reasons. First, it's all open source and nobody like you have to ha earn something to uh, get a living yeah. to live your life. So all these big tech companies offer like huge salary and bonuses, etc which is not there in Bitcoin yet because there are very few companies. Although I'd say that there are startups who are trying to build solutions, but they're not very attractive as like Google or Amazon, et cetera. Right. right. Yeah. So uh, those are, that is one of the things. Also like parental pressure is always a thing. Like mm -hmm. I also face that because my parents are also not sure. Although they trust me that I'm doing the right thing, but because they don't understand Bitcoin, they're not sure about it. So exactly. that's what I try to do. I try to explain people Bitcoin and how, what are the problems in the financial system and how Bitcoin fixes it. So once you understand the problems and how Bitcoin fixes this, all you would want to do is to work on Bitcoin and fix the world, basically. Right. And yeah. That that is the problem because in our education system, we are taught nothing about how the financial system and the economy actually works. So this ignorance has is uh, one of the things why people don't stay in Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Right, and and uh, so 
if we talk about now let's uh, talk about those people who might actually want to get into bitcoin they just don't know it yet so there are a lot of people from different walks of life not just students they can be experienced developer also and uh, yeah. somebody who just found out about bitcoin uh, found out about bitcoin knows the basic development has been working in tech can do this thing is a good and decent developer and wants to get started what do you think like that kind of person wants as resources or guidance or helping materials that they should be looking for what kind of things that you see yourself that you might find useful in your own journey that are missing in the space so uh, if you are an experienced developer so i think mastering bitcoin is the best book to get started into bitcoin development also to understand why bitcoin is important i think you should read bitcoin standard so these are the best two books in future i think there are a lot of video course there there are not a lot of video courses available for uh, bitcoin technicals mm-hmm. so that's something which i look forward to doing and helping make and i think we need some video courses explaining the technicals of bitcoin because like reading a book is not everyone's cup of cake so some understand it better through a video or a udemy course Oh, and some understand concepts better by reading them through blogs right. and books so right. that's a big missing part in the technical uh, technical reading thing mm-hmm. so we need more courses on uh, bitcoin technicals yeah makes sense and uh, so uh, that has basically concluded our conversation about bitcoin and the journey and it kind of seems like you you are going to be working on bitcoin for a considerable period of time for now this brings us to the question that i always ask is like the most stupidest question to ask ever is what is bitcoin to me bitcoin is the revolution which will fix the broken uh, financial system in the world mhm yep that's that's a, that's a, that's a pretty decent uh, the decent definition of bitcoin and 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 what exactly about bitcoin that basically made you hook to it is it that the solution of a very large kind of problem or is it like the technical challenge that the kind of like problems that you need to solve in order to create a system like this and make it working although i would say that technical part is pretty amazing and uh, there has been a lot of work done like uh, bitcoin is a technical marvel for sure like i would uh, i think everyone would agree to that but for me i think the most fascinating part and why i love bitcoin is that uh, it gives money it gives wealth back to the people where it belongs so there's a difference between a difference between money and wealth so bitcoin empowers the actual users at the grassroots and not the big bankers and the people up uh, of the food chain totally totally so, and uh, there there is a there there is a certain kind of like philosophical and metaphysical reason to be associated uh, in 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 improving out whatever this system is whatever this math is that is going on in the background because somewhere deep down we kind of like commonly understand like this is a thing that not just we need but everybody in the world needs and yeah, everybody exactly. will the world eventually get it whether whether we like tell them about it or whether we just keep doing our code it doesn't matter it's kind of like a fundamental human need that humans have been like seeking for since time immemorial right and that's what makes it exciting that's what makes working in this space exciting and uh, yep yeah there's one quote which i'd say to wrap this up so uh in 19 so we say that working on bitcoin right now is like working on the internet in the 1990s so when the internet first launched it was only used by military and a few people and it, the people who wanted to use internet were very skeptical and how it would affect their lives but now like everyone uses internet right. so i i think like we are at the stage we are in the 1990s of internet and right now we are building bitcoin yeah. and eventually people would realize that they this is uh, what, what they need and would eventually adopt bitcoin yep 
totally and uh, and uh, very happy myself to be part of this journey very happy to have you guys and get a community around us to work in this path together and it's going to be an exciting ride because there are a lot of things to build there are a lot of things to make and uh, and and it, it can only work out in this community fashion where different things are do different people are doing different things for their own different reasons and Thank you, Anmul, again for coming us, coming here with us and spending this time. Uh, it has been a really nice and enlightening conversation with you, and we hope to so do this soon, sometimes later. Yeah, thanks, Raj. Thanks for like inviting me, and you have been doing great work yourself, Thank like you uh, building this whole community and like doing this, uh, recording this video and inviting people to talk about Bitcoin. I think this will really help the community and especially the new aspiring developers who want to get into Bitcoin development. So Absolutely. thank you for that. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure and I'm very much humbled and fortunate to contribute in this community in this way. So we will keep building and we will keep the Bitcoin conversation alive. Thanks everybody for joining us and this is Anmol Sharma with Bitcoin Talk. See you in the next one. Bye.